This is the second part of Lecture 11, talking about serial communications. Last time, we talked about the U.S. art and the communication using U.S. art. Today, we're going to look specifically at the I2C communication and also the SPI communication protocols. So there's a number, there are three ways of doing serial communications, and so there's obviously a, a lot going on. Uh, much more than I will have time to go into in these brief lectures. So, let's get started. First, we're going to talk about the I2C communication, or the TWI communication. The, this is a communication standard that was put out by Philips Electronics, and so they, it's actually proprietary to some extent, and so that's why it's, it's not uncommon. Well, that's why the um, AT Mega calls it TWI, two-wire interface, because Philips actually has a has a trademark patent on I2C. So, so you, but they're both the same communication standard. It's just that one is proprietary, the other is not. So it's the same idea, though. So that's the I2C communication, inter-integrated circuit serial protocol. Sometimes you'll see it as IIC, sometimes I2C or I squared C, also called two-wire interface. So in the Arduino, we're going to see all the registers called TWI or TW something to indicate the two-wire interface. It allows up to 127 devices to be connected. Each device has a unique address, and so that's how the communication goes in, in the beginning of the communication the address is is transmitted and that's who, who determines how they determine who's it's speaking to up to 400 kilohertz data rate so it's not the fastest uh, communication standard but it gets the job done so the connections are fairly simple to make again two wire interface well it's actually as you can see here three wires one of the wires is power okay so it's there's nothing fancy about that no special communication happens and so basically each uh, each of these two buses the, the serial data bus and the serial clock uh, bus or actually wires these are just wires and so each device is connected to both of these two wires and these two wires are then pulled up to power so so notice that there, there's only one set of pull-up resistors associated with this device and um, generally speaking this pull-up connection happens in the master that's generally where it happens and then the other device is just hook on okay so um, so they're all connected just with two wires to each other and and um, so we have these these pull-ups pull that are used. Each of these devices are connected uh, in a way that, that actually can like remove themselves from the bus. So, so in general, you can have up to 7F devices, or, or basically 127 devices. The pull-up resistors are in this range from 1.5 kilo ohms to 100 kilo ohms. The, the precise value that's chosen really is a is, depends upon the application that you're using, um, but it, generally that's the resistor. So it's a, there's a wide range of pull-up resistors that can be used. The communication is bi-directional, and it uses a, what's called an open drain bus. That's that concept of an open drain. That's a circuit concept based on uh, transistors (FETs), and that basically is what allows. So the the concept of an open drain allows the circuit to be opened up in the sense that it um, it allows the um, devices, individual devices, to either be connected in or not connected. So basically in communicating the device pulls down while the resistors pull up. So whenever it wants to communicate the device pulls the line down. Okay. More, It's more flexible than the SPI communication we're going to see there are so many options with the I2C or the TWI. So many options. We're, we're barely going to scratch the surface 
Uh, we're going to actually get pretty deep, but it's still scratching the surface. But it is slower. It is a slower protocol. So you, you have trade-offs here between flexibility and speed. Here's kind of a block diagram of how everything is connected. So again, you have the clock, SCL, and you have the data line. Associated with that, you have a slew rate control that, that controls how quickly the pins can transfer when they switch from, from low to high or high to low. That's called the, the speed at which it can move from low to high is called the slew rate. Okay, And then you have a spike filter. Again, we know that digital signals are not purely digital. They're actually there's actually a lot of analog stuff that's happening and so uh, what can, one of the things that can happen is when you switch you can get a large spike and so this kind of filters out filters out that spike so it's connected to the bus interface unit the bus interface has a start stop control arbitration detection means that it determines if you have two things that want to talk at the same time who gets to go first spike suppression and here's the address or data shift register so this is where the data register comes in and then there's an acknowledge bit in there we'll, we'll see where, what what that's all about there's a bit rate generator associated with this thing so that's kind of like the baud rate we saw in the um, in the US art a address match so this is this is checking to see you know if the remember remember each device has a unique address so it's checking to see if for example, when one when the master wants to talk with a slave, it has to first send out the address. So when the, but all the slaves are connected, and so basically what happens is each all of the slaves check to see if the address that was sent is their address or not. Okay, so they they need this the address match unit in here, and then finally you have this control unit. It has a status register, control register. Okay, so this is the the overall view of the I2C communication. The protocol, basically, each device could be a master, a slave, or both at different times. It can't be both at the same time. It can, only, it can be a master, because remember, on the bus, there's only one master at a time. Okay, so in communicating, the first byte after the start condition has the least significant bit that indicates a read, so if it's reading, that means it's not writing, and it's set by the master. The remaining seven bits are the unique device address. So the master determines whether the information is going to be read or written, and which device is going to be doing the reading and writing, or writing. So the processing can be done either by polling, which we've seen that kind of thing before, or by interrupts. So a transmission consists of a start condition, then an address packet consisting of a read-write indicator, like I described, and then a slave acknowledgement. And okay, so there's the slave acknowledgement, then the read-write indicator. So so SLA plus R, or sometimes you'll see SLA plus W. So you'll see a number of you'll see this kind of thing a lot. So slave acknowledgement is that SLA slave acknowledge. A lot of acronyms. With the, with the SPI communication, I'm sorry, I2C communication. Then you'll get one or more data packets going along, and then finally a stop condition. Stop condition isn't just a bit like we had with US art. It's a, it's a little bit different. It's actually a combination of things going on. So, so in terms of timing, we have some things going on. A start condition is signaled by a falling edge of the data while the clock is held high. Okay, so that's the condition. So you have a clock, which generally is clocking, but in the start condition, the clock is being held high and then the data drops. Okay, so that's what indicates the start of communication. Okay, the start is initiated by the master and the clock is also controlled by the master. So, so this, uh, this is what happens. And then, as we mentioned, the eight data bits, the mis mi most significant bit first, then the acknowledge is sent by the slave. So down is the acknowledge bit. Okay, so um, 
So at the end, the, the master, for example, is sending data to the slave. If there was some kind of error in what was sent, the, er, the slave will send a no acknowledgement. If the data was sent correctly, the slave will send an acknowledge bit. So the data may be sent by the master, but the slave responds, and so the only bit it the only bit it does it sets is that acknowledge bit. And basically, what it does is it pulls the line low to acknowledge. If it does not pull the line low, that means that's called a not acknowledge, and the master then interprets that as the data having not been sent properly. So that's that's it's uh, not exactly parity, but it's it is a uh, it is a way of acknowledging whether the data was received or not. So that's the uh, the timing, the stop condition. So here P stands for stop, is basically a rising edge of the data while the clock is held high. So in other words, the clock stops, and then the data has a rising edge. Okay, so that's the that's the timing associated with the with the I2C or TWI. So with the TWI, there are a number of registers that are very important to us. And so you can see already there are quite a few registers here. There's the, uh, the bitrate register, TWBR. It basically controls the period of the clock when the TWI module is operating in the master mode. So this is this is the these are registers on the Arduino. Okay, this, this is not what's happening on a device. This is what's happening in the Arduino. So the Arduino itself can be used either as a master or a slave. So when it's in master mode, then this data is used. Okay, then you have the address register when the uh, um, when the TWI is module is receiving data. This identifies its address. So remember, even the master is going to have an address. Right. TWCR, control register. Um, incidentally, it's possible for two devices to accidentally have the same address. Okay, and so it's it's helpful to know what all the addresses are of your devices before you start working with them, just in case there may be a conflict between one device and another in terms of their addresses. If you have a conflict, that's a problem. At least with the Arduino, I, I don't know of any way to get around a conflict of two devices having the same address. Now, the likelihood of that happening is pretty small, but it's possible. It's possible for that to happen. Uh, the control register basically controls the operation of the unit and is also used to generate the start, stop, and acknowledge pulse. It also enables the, the SPI, um, I2C communication, TWI communication, including the interrupt enables. The status register reflects the status of the logic, and uh, basically it, it also holds the prescale value of the TWI uh, clock pulse generator. So that's the prescale value. The, the prescale value is in there. The uh, data register. In transmit mode, it holds the data that's going to be sent. In receive mode, it holds the data that's received. So that's similar to the US art. Here is kind of the sequence of communication as things happen. Notice that in this diagram, which is taken directly from the AT Mega, um, the AT Mega manual, um, there are a number of acronyms used, and in particular, the, the names of the registers are used here. Um, so I'll, I'll try to talk about these as we go along, what these guys are. So first, here's the application ac uh, action, and then there's also the uh, TWI uh, um, hardware action. So basically, the program writes to the control register to initiate transmission of start. So this here, application, this is happening in the master. Okay, so here's the here's the beginning. This here's the start is initiated. So this is what's happening on the TWI bus. Okay, and in particular, 
So this is the bus, which actually has the two lines, remember, the clock and the data. Okay, so once the once the initiation of the start happens, remember, that's the, uh, the clock held high while the data register goes low, the data uh, line. So when that happens, the TW uh, int, the interrupt bit, TW int is the interrupt bit, that's pin 7 of the uh, TW control register, TWCR. So this is set. The status code also indicates that a start condition has been set. Okay, so this bl this little black space means that the TW int has been set. Okay, so next the master checks the status register to see if start was sent. Then the uh, application loads in the slave acknowledge and the write. Slave acknowledge then is the is the uh, address of that slave and then the bit that indicates whether you're reading or writing. That's loaded into the data register. It also loads the appropriate control signals into the control register making sure that the yeah, making uh, so this is actually copied from an official manuscript even. They make mistakes too. Um, making sure that twint is written to one. Then um, TWSTA is a bit that indicates that the register is empty. And so this is written to zero, meaning the register is not empty. Okay, And so in this time, this data is being sent. Slave acknowledge plus the read or write bit. At the end of that, those bits being sent, the acknowledge bit is sent. Okay, The acknowledge bit is sent. So in this case, the interrupt bit is set, and the status code indicates that the slave address and the acknowledge uh, that that was sent, and that the acknowledge was received. Okay, so this is actually this is stuff that the master has been doing up until this point. Here, the slave is doing this, and and so then the master acknowledges that the slave was received. I mean that the acknowledgement was received. Then. So that's occurring during this period. Then the processor checks the status register to see if that uh, slave acknowledge plus W was sent and the acknowledge was received. The master then loads the data that it wants to send into the data register. It also loads the appropriate control signals into the control register and then make sure that the interrupt bit is set to 1. Okay, so this is, uh, there's a lot of stuff that happens at this point here. Then the data gets sent. Okay, so, so the data gets sent. After the data is sent, then the slave sends back the acknowledge bit. And after the acknowledge bit, then again, the interrupt bit is set. And this in status code indicates that data sent is, and the acknowledge was received. Then the processor checks to see if the data was sent and acknowledge was received. Then the processor then loads the appropriate control signals and sends it sends a stop to the um, to the control register and also makes sure that the interrupt pin is written to one. And then the stop is sent. So this is. This is an example of how one data byte gets sent. Just one, one data byte. So, as you can see, the SPI communication is much more complicated than the US art. Much more complicated. There's a lot of other stuff that's going on here. But it's that other stuff that makes the communication very flexible. Okay. Principles of I2C. Uh, I'm not going to go into this details. This is basically putting into words what that other diagram describes. So I'll let you read that in your leisure. Okay, let's take a look at some of the registers. The control register has these has these bits. There's there's the uh, interrupt bit. Then we have the interrupt acknowledge. I'm sorry, the enable acknowledge. Okay. 
um, the data register empty bit. So that's the bit that tells us that the data register is empty. This bit tells us there's a frame error. Okay, so this tell this so notice that we don't have parity in this communication scheme, um, but this tells us something about the, the whether the stop bit was occurred properly. Um, receive complete. This is the bit that tells us if the receive has been complete. Uh, has is been complete, and that the data has not yet been read. Okay, uh, here's the receive complete. There's the transmit complete. Okay, this is set when all the data has been transmitted. And then finally we have this interrupt enable. And actually there shouldn't be a frame error here. But anyway, that's that's actually over here. I don't know what anyway, this must have been left over from something. So then we have the interrupt enable. So that's where the interrupt enable is is set. Next we have the status register. The status register tells us not only the status of the communications, but also the prescalar value. So the prescalar value, these two bits, basically determine the speed at which the communication is happening. Um, so notice that these uh, status bits, um, there, there's actually a whole combination of things associated with that. And actually they had difficulty finding information about what those that status was all about. So I'm not sure exactly what those status bits are communicating, but they must be communicating something important or they wouldn't put them in. Notice that they're only read. The processor sets them. So you, you can't control what they are. The processor sets them. Um, so for our purposes, the bits that we're concerned about are these prescalar bits. Here's the bit rate register. So the bit rate register is, uh, is similar to like what we had with the baud rate before. So this is the formula that uh, determines the uh, the clock frequency, and it also uh, takes into account this prescalar values that, that were set in the other register, the status register. The address register has, remember, remember the address for a particular device is only seven bits, so that's these bits here. And then we also have this extra bit over here that's used for some uh, esoteric little function but so the address is basically stored in here and so if your Arduino is acting as a slave then it's going to have its slave address in here and that's that's where the address is that the, that it, it's, it uses as a slave okay it also if you are using what's called a multi master mode which is kind of an, another esoteric use then it will also have an address in there. Here's the data register, and of course it just has data in it. It's in transmit mode, it's the data, it's the next byte to be transmitted. In receive mode, it's the last byte received. Here is an example code that actually goes through and sets some of the bits for the, um, the communication. So notice there's it's basically following the process of that flowchart that we saw. So I'm not going to go into this in, in this in very much detail, but I wanted it to be available to you so you could see uh, basically how the code would go through and set all of these things. Um, again, here's, here's some more of the code. Now, um, it turns out that uh, that in the Arduino environment there is something called wire.h that actually does the TWI communication. Okay, and um, so in this particular program that I have here, it not only uses the TWI communication but it also uh, uses a serial communication so that it can write to the um, to the serial monitor. Okay, so um, what this device does is it goes through and it, it, as a master, it goes through and writes the, the uh, it basically sends a message to every address. Okay, in this case, it's 120 addresses. 
127 is the actual number of addresses. So this actually just goes through and does 120 of them. So And it just cycles through. So basically, it's sending a message to each of these devices. And if the device acknowledges, then the processor knows there's a device at that address. Okay, so this is a way of just this program basically just goes through and pings each device to see if the device is present. Okay, and so that's what this goes through. And so this actually uses uh, what's called the wire communication. And so wire dot begin transmission sends the address. Okay, and then it does a end transmission. So the end transmission, remember when it when you that just tells it to send the stop. Okay. So it sends the transmission if there's no error. Okay. So the error when you send and do an end transmission, if there's an error, it'll tell you. So if there's an error, then uh, or rather, if there's no error, then this will it will print out the at the uh, I2C address at whatever address was found. Otherwise, at certain addresses, it'll if it gives you an error, it'll tell you there's an error. So if error is equal to four, okay. So notice error is equal to zero or error is equal to four. Um, So if there are no devices, then at the end it says no devices found. So that's basically what this program does, is it goes through and it and it just pings all the devices. So for example, our Gravitech shield that we use in lab has three I2C devices. It has a digital thermometer. It has this uh, four-digit LCD dis LED display. And then it also has this EEPROM. It also has this RGB LED but that's not using I2C communication. Okay, so these are the these are the three main devices that are used on the Gravitech Shield. So they each have their own address associated with them. So that is the I2C or TWI communication, just a broad overview. So for the most part, when we use the I2C communication, we will just use the wire library. But it is helpful to understand what's going on in all of this so that if you have a very specific application uh, and, you're, and it's time critical. So the wire library is good, but again, because the, the I2C is so general, if you use it in its general form, it's going to be a lot slower than if you have it for a very specific narrow application. So I've given you uh, a very fast overview of it, but there's certainly much more that could be said. And having said that now, we're going to move on to the SPI communication. So the SPI communication, Serial Peripheral Interface, is another uh, applica app application of serial communication. This was uh, developed by Motorola and um, just a different way of doing things. Okay, so, in, so we kind of have to step back and remember this is now a completely different plan for how to do serial communication. It's not like the US art and it's not like the I2C communication. It's just a completely different method. So here is an example of interconnection. So we have a master and then we have three slaves. So these slaves are devices that are connected up to the master. So notice that all of the devices are connected to the clock. All of them are connected to these other two devices master out slave in master in slave out so this is remember this is a bi-directional communication so master out slave in means that's transmitting from the master to the slave master in slave out means that's what's being transmitted to the master from a slave associated with each device is a slave select pin so notice that the number of devices here corresponds to the number of slaved select pins. So these are the same no matter how many devices. So as you can see, the SPI communication requires at least four wires. So it actually requires three wires plus the number of devices. For each device, there's a slave select. 
So in this case, I, I re require six lines in order, to con in order to communicate with these three devices. Okay, so again, each of these has the clock, master out, slave in, master in, slave out, slave select. So notice that it has the bar, which means that it's active low. Okay, so when the master wants to communicate with the slave or receive data from a slave, it's, it, drops, it drops one of these lines. So for example, if it wants to talk to slave two, it pulls that line low, and then the slave knows that it's going to be communicating with the master. Okay, so that's, the, that's how the communication uh, is set up. That's the configuration. And of course, you can see how you can do many uh, other devices as well. So the SPI communication is synchronous. It is synchronous communication. It has a clock with it. Okay. Now, um, the I2C communication also had a clock. And uh, but, so again, the master in this case uh, establishes the clock. The clock is it can have two polarities. It can have a positive polarity or a negative polarity. So it depends on whether you're going to be using the rising edge or the falling edge. Okay, so you can set the polarity to be either. So polarity zero is positive polarity. Polarity one is negative pol polarity. But again, because it's just oscillating, the polarity doesn't mean anything specific, but it is an option. Um, to me, I don't understand why they give it an option, but they do anyway. It seems to to me, it just seems to make things more complicated. But they anyway, that's what it is. So C pole, okay, is the polarity. C fa is the phase, okay, and the phase determines um, whether you're going to be reading on uh, one edge or the other. So. For each of these devices, you have a leading edge and a falling edge. Okay, usually something happens on a leading edge and something happens on a falling edge. So on each edge of the clock, something is going to happen. Okay, so on each edge of the clock, something is going to happen. So remember also, this is bidirectional communication. So the master in slave out and the master out slave in can both be sending things there can be data on both of those lines and in general that will be the case in, in specific cases it won't be okay so you can also daisy chain the the uh the spi devices so this is another way notice the master out master in slave out goes in here and this goes into there and then this goes. So you can actually daisy chain these. So that's a somewhat flexible. But again, that's that's probably more more complicated and uh, it's not used as often, but it is possible. Serial peripheral fin interface is synchronous. There is a clock and it can be set to various rates, uh, a wider range of rates than RS-232. It is ideal for microcontrollers. That might have an imprecise clock. Okay, so first of all, SPI, the master controls the clock. No clock, no transfer. Okay, that's that's a sim simple thing. The slaves are controlled by the master clock. The slaves cannot manipulate the clock. Okay, data is only output during the rising or falling edge of the clock. So during the leading edge, uh, Data is latched during the opposite edge of the clock. Okay, so latched, what does latched mean? Hmm. Latched means the data, so when it's not latched, the data can change at any time. When it's latched, the data is fixed, it's stopped so that it can read and it reads the, reads the data without worrying about it, the data changing while it's trying to read. So sometimes you will see see it saying instead of read, it will be sample. Okay, so that's just another way of that you'll see it right now. Here are some, here are some of this, the registers. SPI control register. So here's SPI interrupt enable. SPI enable. So you, obviously you need to set this bit if 
if, the, if you're going to be doing any SPI communication. The data order, is it going to go least significant bit or most significant bit first? Um, this is master or slave select bit. Here's the C pole bit. Here's the C phase bit. So the polarity and the phase are set by these bits. And then these two bits um, Okay, so okay, B3 is polarity, phase, and then these two bits, the SPR bits, are uh, clock rate select. So that's the rate, the bit rate select. So as I mentioned, you have a, a polarity and phase, and so depending on what those combinations are, you get these combinations of things. So on this one, the leading edge, you read on the rising edge the leading edge is is rising and you do a read on a rising edge the trailing edge is falling and you do a change so that is that's when you can change the data from one state to the next okay so so on one edge the data is red the other edge the data changes so here read on rising change on falling here we have change on rising read on falling Okay, so notice that that's just by changing the phase bit. Here we have read on following, change on rising. Notice that's the same as this one here. It's just the, the only difference is which is the leading edge, which is the trailing edge. But what actually happens is the same thing. Similarly, over here we have change on falling, read on rising. That's the same as this. The only difference is which is the leading edge, which is the trailing edge. So they, to, to me, uh, I don't understand why they did this. There's probably some good reason that some engineer figured out and made sense, but it doesn't make sense to me. It seems to me you can just get rid of the polarity. And so if you just just assume one of these polarities, then you get these two options, which really you only get two options anyway. So I don't know. Anyway, but that's that's what happens. So there's a little bit of confusion there that students sometimes have. It's like, why are they? Well, that's just someone made that decision. Okay. So when the phase is zero, so when we're restric restricting ourselves to zero phase, we can have two different clocks depending on whether the polarity is zero or one. Okay, and this this bit is called the sample bit or the read bit, or the read bit. This is a blip that occurs on that rising on that leading edge. Okay, so so notice that. Here, here's what's happening with the data. Okay, here's what's happening with the data. So the data, so with these little X occurs where the data changes. So notice the data changes here, and by the time it gets to this edge, it's nice and stable, and so you can do a read. And then over here, the data changes again on the falling edge, in this case, the trailing edge. That's where a change happens. So in this case, you uh, on the leading edge you read, on the trailing edge you change. Okay, so when the phase is zero. So here, notice, notice this is the case, the leading edge and the trailing edge. So depending on which polarity you use, the leading could be a rising or a falling. The trailing could be a falling or a rising. So, but this is always correct. The leading edge you read, the trailing edge you change. So that's the situation. So depending also on what you choose for the order bit, if the order is zero, then you will send the most significant bit first. If the order is one, then you'll send the least significant bit first. Okay, so that's that's how the data goes. And so you have all these, all these different options. If you just stick with one option, and you always use that one option, you're gonna do okay. And now this is the case when the phase is equal to one. When the phase is equal to one, we have the opposite situation. On the leading edge, we change, and the trailing edge, we read. Okay, so it's very similar to the other case, but uh, it's just opposite. So again, six of one, half a dozen of the other. Just pick one, stick with it, and you'll be happy. All right, you'll be you'll be good. Okay, S. Um, status register so notice there are only only three bits to concern ourselves with the interrupt flag whether there's a flag so this flag is set whenever the interrupt is going on 
right collision flag. So if, if you're trying to, two things are trying to ride at the same time, and you can get a collision. Okay, a right collision flag. And then this also is used to set the speed, the bit rate. So it's a double, you can do a double speed if you set that bit. The SPI clock rate uh, depends upon that double rate bit and then these other two bits, okay, these rate bits. So depending on these combinations, you can get these various combinations. Notice that these values um, are, are basically half of these values. So notice that 64 actually appears twice here. But anyway, so these are the, the clock frequencies that are available, the clock rates that are available um, by appropriate choice of these rate bits. Okay, so that's how the clock rate is selected. So, SPI math, here is a uh, subroutine that sets the master. This initi initializes the master. Okay, so notice that um, DDR SPI, data direction register for the SPI, this sets the bits to be used for this communication. And then the, the control register then, we're going to be setting these bits. One is going to go into the master. So this sets up the Arduino as a master. Okay. This is one of the rate bits. And this is going to enable the SPI uh, communication. So this is the initialization. Then we have the transfer or transmit bit. Okay. So we, you pass it some data, a, a byte and it puts that into the data register. When you put it into the data register, it knows that communication needs to happen, and the communication starts happening. So basically, this command here, this wait command, basically waits for everything to, uh, to go through properly. And so as long as that flag is being set, then we're, then we're so in other words, this flag, until this flag is done, then we were we we will um we will wait in this routine. So that's what this is all about. So if the Arduino is being used as a slave, then you would write this code to initialize it. And this is what we would use if we were receiving data as a slave. So very similar to what we had before. So these are just some sample code programs that show how to use the SPI communication. In this case, notice we don't actually have to resort to using a library. So in this way, it's much more simple to use than the SPI, uh, the I2C communication. There's a lot less overhead associated with this. And the reason why it's a lot less overhead is because you're actually talking from, from the master directly to the slave and it selects which slave it's going to talk to so it doesn't have to f there's actually a, a hardwired line that goes there and so that you don't have to all this business with an address to worry about okay so so each of the types of communications we've looked at have their pros and their cons each one has its pluses and minuses the the US art communication is great it's got a lot of flexibility but it's connecting one device to another one device. Okay, so it's it's good for that setting. It's fairly simple to use, and uh, it's one, but it's one to one. So multiple devices being connected, you have the SPI and the I2C. The uh, the S, the I2C is much more flexible in ter in terms of being able to talk to multiple devices. Okay, and it's two wires, so it's hardware. Hardware-wise, it's very simple. The SPI um, can talk to multiple devices, but it needs another wire for each device it's sending to, so it's more complicated hardware-wise. But software-wise, it's much easier because you don't have to send the address each time you want to send some data. So this is the, the lesson on serial communications. Thanks for watching.